that special relationship between a therapist and his patient. One of the fundamentals of psychological therapy? Well, perhaps not anymore with the advent of psychological software for computers, a shrink on a disk. How good is this stuff? Is it just a toy or a serious tool? We'll get answers to these questions as we take a look at psychological software on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by a grant from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies. AFIPS, sponsors of OAC 86, the nation's leading conference on business technology. For conference information, call 800-OAC-1986. Exploring today's business solutions. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte, the international standard. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe, and this is Gary Kildolan. Gary, we're taking a look at a program here called Intracourse. And what it claims to be able to do is to help couples with sexual compatibility or incompatibility problems. And I've answered about 100 or so questions, giving it a profile of two fictional people. And it's giving me now a graphic readout on one of these people, the intimacy versus distance uh, factor. Another one here is conventionality versus ingenuity, for example, uh, individuality versus interpersonality. And in fact, it'll give me a compatibility percentage on 12 different characteristics of these two particular people. It's just one example of the whole host of psychological software which is out on the market right now. Question I have is how does a dumb number crunching computer do anything useful with regard to human behavior? Well, Stuart, number crunching computers have been used for years to sum up the scores, say, of objective tests like personality inventories. When it comes to non-objective uh, programs, well, programs like this, for example, can be a lot of fun, but there's a real question about how valuable mm -hmm. the computer analysis really is. But it may give us a chance to use things like expert systems, rule-based systems, to get those meaningful answers. We're going to take a look at a whole range of psychological software today, from self-help programs to more sophisticated software that's used in professional psychotherapy. We'll begin by taking a look at how psychiatrists use psychological software to help people with serious mental problems. Patients recovering from severe head trauma usually undergo lengthy rehabilitation to try to regain basic cognitive functions. Exercises to improve concentration, memory, or motor skills involve repetitive games administered by a therapist. But computers are changing cognitive therapy, often with impressive results. Mental exercises most suited to head injury patients are easily adapted to a computer program. Specialized software, like this program developed by the Karen Lambert Foundation, help to redevelop lost cognitive skills with logic-based games. Doctors don't expect computerized routines to replace therapists who sit by patients during sessions, but in some cases, patients can work by themselves, and the challenge of keeping up with the computer keeps them motivated. The program also seems to provide patients with a tactile sense of their own progress. As they advance in the program, head injury victims increasingly feel their diminished capacities. So a patient that can gauge his own progress is psychologically stronger. Leading a brain injured person back into the mainstream of life calls for a combination of physical and psychological therapy. While still in an early stage, cognitive software seems to be making a difference. Rehabilitation centers can use their staff more efficiently, and most importantly, patients can go home sooner. Joining us now in the studio are Dr. Jim Johnson, a psychologist and the president of Human Edge Software, makers of Mind Prober and Mind Over Miners, among others. Also, we have with us Dr. James Gardner, also a psychologist who has developed some software which is used in treating serious mental health problems. Gary? 
Uh, Jim, we'll start out with a question, simple question. Uh, is it really possible nowadays with a computer program to get meaningful results of a subjective analysis of someone's behavior? Sure. I think that uh, at, a, at a surface level, the kind of thing that you and I might want on a day-to-day -day basis, you can do a lot with a computer. That's not to say that it can do the same thing as a professional or, a, or somebody who's going to take a more intense look, but uh, you can do uh, certainly much more in an interactive mode than you can, say, with a book, which is the common alternative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Jim, what's your well, I'd be a little more cautious than Jim. We spend on the programs we develop a great deal of time assessing the reliability, validity, and accuracy of the data that's inputted right while it's inputted. And we won't run a program uh, unless that information is reliable, valid, and accurate. And where it's not, we require the people to go back and change the input until they reach a certain level, and only then will we run a program. OK, in your case, you're dealing with professionals. And, and in, this, in the particular case of the program, we'll see in a minute, that's more oriented, I guess, toward a consumer. Sure. Uh, consumer. sure. Can we take a look at the program, see how it works? Sure. This is Mind Prober, and it's the... No, it's mi Mind Over Miners. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> mind Over Miners. Uh, and it really has two components. You assess yourself, you assess uh, your child, and then it gives you a report. Now, the purpose of assessing yourself and, and the other is so it can categorize who you are, categorize who the other person is, and then tailor down the strategy for uh, how to deal with them. In my so let's case, see how you do that assessment, Jim. We've gone ahead and, and I filled in a series of things. And there are simple adjectives like bossy, active, and so on. I'm not going to go through all of these in the interest of time. So assuming I've gone through those 50 items, now I'd go through and I'd want to assess the child that is uh, of interest. In this case, I have put in my daughter, Jenny. Okay. Let's stop just a second to see some of these traits, though, Jim. Uh, All right, so it's, it's rating on agree or disagree on, like, anxious. Uh, she's not bossy. She is, like most teenagers, <laughs> active, clear thinking, not idealistic, and so on. OK, and there's about 50 of these. <clears throat> about 50 right. in each case that are developed scientifically by uh, norming various groups of people observing their children. So if we drop out here for a minute and go to uh, what the output of the, uh, the program is, again, coming back to the main uh, menu, you can then uh, ask for a report. The only person we have in here is Jenny. Uh, and the report comes out uh, where it tells you there's a book that comes along with it, tells you there's some generic advice. It's a little bit uh, of a built-in uh, advertisement. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and we want this one to go to the screen. And what comes out is for the first section is understanding her. And the point of this is to talk about who the two of you are and how you're likely to get along. No advice in this, but just to give you some idea. Talks in this case about we're both adventure-seeking and be prepared for that. Don't be too upset if she's like you are. And this goes on for roughly a page and a half. Next thing, it gives a set of specific advice in areas that uh, parents are interested in. The, in this case, it's improving communication. It says, because she is energetic, uh, repeat things over and over. Don't expect her to get it the first time. Um, tell her to stop and listen, reminder. It goes on like this through about uh, what would be three or four written pages to give you advice from a series of things. If you want to increase her performance now, It'll give you a, uh, uh, a brief piece of information. It says, keep her activities short term. Don't give her something long term. The whole point is, is what we've done is we've boiled down the expert literature. We've related them to who I am as a parent, who she is as a child. And we've only given that kind of advice that's relevant and doable by the two of you. Now, on, a, on the surface, uh, people might say, well, this, this is a superficial program. It is, uh, they're, they're just asking a couple of questions and come up with a few mm -hmm. paragraphs. Is, is this technology based in, say, a, a more professional system of some sort? Oh, sure. The, mm -hmm. um, uh, these programs, this particular program, we have about five to ten man years in. I'm, I'm unhappy to say because it took a lot longer than I think there's a, a thought would happen. There's, there's a tremendous amount of research. And in order to build these programs, we have to go through all the extra books as well as the research area and abstract them and pull them down to the things. They're not, we market them as something to, um, uh, to have, to be useful to parents, but we use a kind of tongue-in-cheek attitude. Mm -hmm. But I'm a former professor and a former scientist, and we don't put out anything that we haven't done a good deal of research on. Jim, what is your opinion of this program? Is it valuable? Well, I think, it's, uh, I think it's a very valuable tool for people who deal with uh, non-serious problems. Mm -hmm. The kind of work we do uh, is dealing with uh, severe aggression and self-abuse and destructiveness. And for those kinds of programs, 
we need uh, 2,000 bits of information, for example, whereas here they're using uh, 50 bits of information. Now, the, the kind of program that you're, you're working with, is it, is it widely used by psychologists right now? Yeah, our program is used by people in uh, mental health centers, people in group homes and schools and state hospitals for getting, it's the equivalent of going to a university and getting 24 disciplines to sit down for a week and tell you what's going on with that person. Well, they can do that now through our computer program, get that equivalent information. Okay, Jim, this is a kind of simple case, I suppose, of an expert system. You have a much more sophisticated kind of AI component in your BIP program. Tell us about that. Well, our program uh, deals with, uh, there are about 5,000 rules, and in the same way they're also extracted from the professional literature and concerned with medication and nutrition and physical health and a whole host of variables. But when we put that program into operation, there's an artificial intelligence module which, based upon experience, whether or not the person does better or improves, the artificial intelligence module will change the rules and rewrite the rules. So we have a program that actually changes over time and adopts itself to the environment in which you put it. Are there any dangers to this kind of stuff? I mean, is there a risk in somebody getting the wrong kind of advice, taking this stuff too seriously, do you think? Well, we spend, uh, as I said, we spend about a third of our time ensuring that the information that goes in there is accurate. Our programs won't run unless it's got reliable, valid, and accurate information. And the reason for that is just to minimize those kinds of risks. And how about your kind of stuff, Jim? You know, a lot of people, when they hear computer, they say there might be a danger. Uh, I have four kids, and I've had four copies of Dr. Spock. Uh, Dr. Spock started out with saying that you should demand feed a child, then he said you should schedule feed, and then you should breastfeed, you should bottle feed. Uh, advice throughout the ages, all of us have gone to bookstores and have read because we need this kind of thing. Is there a danger? I don't know. We try and do the best we can. We think because we've... Uh, we use an interactive mode and we go to the research and we try and tailor it down to the situation. We make it better than giving the kind of generic advice that you can give with the Gutenberg methodology, which is one general statement that applies to everybody. So I don't see a danger, I see an improvement. What do the professionals in your uh, field uh, feel about this? Do you think well, that this is a threat of some sort? I think it's mixed. I think the whole issue with expert systems and AI mm -hmm. is once you develop a system that in some way mimics an expert, uh, he starts to get threatened. You and I, you and I are the same way, yeah. and so I think they're going to say that, and I think uh, that they're controversial. No Gentlemen, we're out of time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Some psychological software is being used in conjunction with other therapeutic techniques like biofeedback. Wendy Woods has a report on that. This may look like a video game. It is, in a way, but I'm not using a joystick. Instead, a headband with tiny sensors is connected to my head with which I'm trying to control the action on the screen. This is the office of Dr. George Fuller von Bose, a psychologist who uses a simple Commodore 64 computer equipped with an interface box and special software as one of the tools in his biofeedback work. The new um, computerized biofeedback software is now developed in, a, in such a way that it can be used with most people with psychophysiologic disorders. Uh, one of the ways that it can be used is to have the person learn by watching the video screen where their heart rate, their blood pressure, their brain waves or muscle tension is and being able to vary the meters as seen on the screen or the various uh, motivational uh, graphics that's on the screen. In this program, the patient tries to lower the balloon on the screen by relaxing. This, by the way, is called Relax, and it's from Synapse Software. The program also includes a kaleidoscope, which increases in complexity and beauty as the patient becomes more at ease. And the Relax Graph, which more scientifically shows a patient's progress. Still another program at the doctor's disposal enables him to monitor a variety of body functions visible on the screen. The real key in biofeedback is the learning process, not the machine. So the more the machine distracts the person from their learning procedure, the less learning takes place. How well does it work? Well, Dr. Von Bouze is pleased with his patient's progress. And as for me, well, I look pretty relaxed, don't I? For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods.
Joining us now in the studio are Dr. Roger Gould, a psychiatrist and the president of Interactive Health Systems. And also with us is Dr. Bernie Zilbergeld, a psychologist and author and a sometime critic of the use of computers in therapy. Gary? Bernie, uh, we've seen several examples of programs here that are used in a role that might be considered traditionally a therapist role. Uh, is there danger in that? Uh, I think there's uh, quite a few possible dangers. Uh, first of all, let's differentiate. Uh, the first demonstration we saw, um, the mind over minors, I think there's a lot of dangers. Basically, I feel it's a toy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's really nothing scientific behind it at all. I have no idea why somebody would pay $50 for a program like that rather than going out and spending 3 or $4 for a paperback with the same information. Um, I don't know what you do with stuff like that. I, I think if parents view that as a gimmick, a toy, something to play with, see what's going on in the world, fine. Uh, what I'm afraid is that some people might take it real seriously because after all, it's on the, the box uh -huh. from right. which truth emanates. Right. Right. Um, I think that's dangerous. On the other hand, uh, Dr. Gardner's, uh, basically what he has is a database for diagnostics and treatment. I think that has some interesting possibilities. Uh, we don't know, we won't know until it's tested, but certainly he has a lot of variables in there and more than any therapist or any group of therapists could keep in mind at any time. Um, I'd like to see some research on how good it is. Mm -hmm. Roger, you have a system which is used in a slightly different setting in group therapy and maybe you could set up for us the scenario in which you would use uh, this particular system. Sure, most people come to a therapist for short-term work uh, because they have some problem. They might also have some symptoms, but the symptoms are secondary to a problem. And it's easy to identify what a problem is. A problem is that when you're in some state of dissatisfaction and you're not sure what the right thing to do is, so you don't act. Once you're sure what the right thing to do is and you act upon it, then you dissolve the problem. So we have a program that's organized so that you can take any problem and begin to ask the question, what might I do better or different? And is that the right thing for me to do? And when you ask answers, the right thing for me to do, there's two levels. One is that the right choice. Do I really want to do that? Is that good for me to do? And the second is, is it right for me psychologically? That is, given my past learning, can I afford to change my behavior in a new and novel okay, way? Okay, what's the therapeutic setting for how you would use this? A person comes into either a mental health clinic or a psychiatrist or a psychologist's office uh, or people who are referred to in the plan that's used right now uh, as part of a wellness program in which they identify some problems in living they want to help sort out. Uh, in the room will be 10 computers, one therapist, and 10 patients. Uh, they will start out by saying this, the, there'll be an introduction, the computer will begin to then ask them some questions. Each will have their own computer. And basically, what's going on in your life that brought you here? And then from there, they begin to prioritize down, they get a worksheet, and end up with a very specific dissatisfaction in their particular life situation. Okay, you've got your program up here. Show us a couple of the screens that the patient might, might use. Sure. Once the person has, this is about an hour into the program, it's a two-hour session for the first session, there's five of them. Once he has that, the, the next question that comes up is, what can you do differently than you're doing right now that might address this problem in a way that's satisfactory. And we've skipped a number of menus. The first one had to do with the first category is that you can express yourself differently. So if it's a personal problem with another person, it asks you what is it that you need to express, what feelings, who's a particular person, your name, that person's name, and it's all confidential. Okay, what are the choices here? Then you get into a, a second kind of behavior that you can do, which is in any kind of problem you can discipline yourself to act differently uh, to relieve the stress. So for instance, this is called the daily demands. And it asks you, if you were to be on time with your appointments and your commitments, would it solve the specific problem that you're working on? Would it address it, alleviate it? Uh, would you do more, if you did more for people in your life, like your children or your spouse or your parents, would that help? Okay, you so basically your work I've got habits. a multiple choice here to pick which of these things might be the problem I'm trying to address. That's right. And I answer that, and then where do I go from there? You answer that, and then we get into the next category. The next category is how can you use your time and energy differently that's more meaningful to you? Because a lot of times people have problems because they aren't using themselves well in their life or in their work situation. Okay, Roger, when you get these, all these questions answered and get all the data together, what's actually done with that uh, material you've collected? The uh, program continues to guide a person's thinking processes. There's no prescription, mm -hmm. there's no evaluation, um, 
and we help people then sort through, is this the right thing for me to do or so not? So some choices are given as alternatives of what you can do to solve the problem at that point? And well, those. these are the choices. We call it provisional action steps. The person becomes, makes it much more concrete, and then they begin to look at what we call the concerns. I'm concerned that if I take this action step, mm -hmm. it, might, uh, it, it might disturb an important relationship in my life. But now, how, does, how well does this work? When you're in a, in a real group therapy situation, you apply this, uh, what's the result of it? Uh, we've done a thousand patients so far, and about uh, seventy-five percent of the people who came in who were stuck in terms of they could not act in a way to resolve mm -hmm. their problem, by the time the fifth week is over, have acted and have come to a kind of new perspective on themselves as developing adults. And you think adults. that this is something that would have been very difficult to to achieve if you'd not had to, well, or at least a lot more work. All the therapists, <laughs> including myself, who use alternate methods and have used alternate methods, compare this method what we've done before. And this is much more effective and it's much more useful for the patient because they end up with hard copy. They end up owning new skills. The therapist is much less important and a whole sense of, of greater self-esteem and problem solving. Bernie, what do, you, what do you think about this? Uh, actually, this sounds interesting. Uh, however, uh, I'm sorry, Roger, but the outcome really has to be taken with a grain of salt. You can find any therapist from any school of any sort who say the same thing. The real proof, and Roger knows this, is in comparative outcome studies. And uh, he just told me before that, that there's some money available and he's going to be involved. And I would even go further than that because the same holds true of all these programs. Uh, the, the real research will have to be done by somebody else. And we will not have good answers for at least several years down the road. Uh, I think it's real important with all these programs that somebody, you know, it's easy to say we need more research and everybody says it. Not many people do it. Uh, because otherwise you just have a lot of wild claims. Uh, some, you know, some people say uh, computers will lower prices. I can see a lot of ways where they're going to raise prices. The price of therapy. The, the price of anything that involves the computers. Computers are not that cheap, especially when you're buying lots of but them. But what is your feeling in terms of a, really helping out a therapist, if we could have a, a really good expert systems, if they evolved a good expert system, would that be a, a real uh, help to the therapist? I, I, I think what Roger's program is doing, uh, is, I understand it, is trying to automate some of the, take some of the work away from the therapist therapist that a computer can do and nothing he said so far you know turns me off or makes me right. really worried however uh, you know there's those placards that say you know to uh, err is human to really screw things up you need a computer mm -hmm. I think we would do well this is not talking directly to Roger but to keep that in mind this is not more scientific or objective or efficient or anything it's just a box just a with tool. stuff we put in it um, sometimes it's helpful. I, I think this holds some promise. I think Dr. Gould holds some promise. Mm -hmm. But we've got to be careful. I think, okay. Real quick, Roger. Right okay, I think, uh, the important thing is the stuff you put in it. Right. And uh, we're sitting here, and this is what's been put in here is, represents about 80 years of clinical experience by three professors of psychiatry who are also psychoanalysts. So it's as good as can be. I've got, okay. a, call, got a call and end to it. Well, we've seen yet another area today in which computers seem to be making an important contribution, yet some are concerned that computers are moving into uniquely human territory. We asked our commentator, George Morrow, for some final thoughts. Boy, I sure am glad for the therapy of this camera and all you people listening out there because I build up a lot of hostility over the flagrant abuse of this word expert. It's bad enough from programmers. Common sense is not a vital trait for these people. But it's really stressful to have the word mangled by psychologists. You expect someone who understands human behavior to have a lot of common sense. Well, what is an expert? Someone or thing who understands a discipline so well that responses are automatic and based on patterns rather than rules. Experts know that rules must be broken some of the time. When? Knowing that answer is the difference between being expert and competent. Now, our present understanding of how the human mind works is so limited that there's no basis for anyone to claim to be a genuine expert in this area. Therapy wouldn't be the hit or miss thing it is otherwise. The bottom line, then, is that computers should be able to do as good a job as humans in some areas of therapy. After all, successful therapy results in a patient discovering how to solve his own problems. That's how I see it. I'm George Morrow. In the random access file this week, a new research study from Sweden reports that radiation from video display terminals caused birth defects in the fetuses of laboratory mice. 
The research was conducted by the Swedish Occupational Safety Administration. One researcher cautioned that one cannot necessarily draw conclusions for humans based on experiments with mice, but he said we can no longer rule out the possibility that radiation from computer VDTs could harm fetuses. Commodore got a new lease on life this week, though it was a short-term lease. Commodore's bankers extended their current loan deadline one more month to give Commodore executives time to come up with a payback plan. Commodore owes the banks nearly $200 million. A Commodore spokesman said Amiga sales in the fourth quarter should give Commodore its second best quarter in history. KPRO has announced it's eliminating several of its models in an attempt to return to profitability. Discontinued are the KPRO 1 and the KPRO 10, which ran CPM, and two versions of the 286i. The company said it's adding a new hard disk version of the KPRO PC, which will come with a 20 megabyte drive and sell for $18.95. In our legislative update file, the Senate Judiciary Committee is hearing testimony on a bill that would make the FBI's national crime computer accessible to college campus police departments. The ACLU is arguing against the bill, saying 5% of the records in the FBI's computer contain erroneous information. The ACLU says that has led to false arrests and detention of innocent people. Several computer experts this week warned that the major problem in computer security is not with outside hackers, but with corporate insiders. One industry executive said that despite the publicity given to hackers, only 5 to 10 percent of computer crime is committed by hackers. The rest of it is the result of careless internal security. The IRS says their upgraded computer system is working just fine so far. The latest report card shows the feds have processed four times as many refunds as they had by this time last year. Paul Schindler is up next with this week's software review. The People's Car. Simple to use, dependable. I have to assume that's why the people at Lifetree Software paid homage to an automobile when they named their word processor Volkswriter. Now, I admit, we reviewed this one a few years ago, but version 3 is so improved, I can't resist taking another look. There are a lot of new features in 3.0, and they don't cost you anything extra. The price stayed the same. The biggest change is an addition called the Style Sheet. You set one of these up, and it automatically applies to every document of a certain type all letters, for example, or all memos. There's also a built-in spelling checker with a 170,000 word dictionary. You can use it to check a document while writing or go back and check it in batch mode later. Best of all, even with all the new features, Volkswriter 3 is as fast or faster than previous versions. Basically, Volkswriter was good before because of how easy it was to get words into it. Now, with version 3, it's a lot easier to get words out of it, looking just the way you want. This word processor costs $300 from Lifetree Software in Monterey, California. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. The Soviet's TASS news agency has announced that its English language service will soon go online. You can access the Russian newswire via Reuters or the Canadian press service on CompuServe. Finally, the NBA Super Bowl was held last weekend. Three teams of NBA students at Stanford, Harvard, and the University of Pennsylvania all played the Wizard of Wall Street, a stock market simulation game, to see which team of NBAs could make the most money. No results yet, but the winning team will get a real cash prize of $1,000. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by a grant from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies. AFIPS, sponsors of OAC 86, the nation's leading conference on business technology. For conference information, call 800-OAC-1986. Exploring today's business solutions. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte, the international standard.